people with this crazy demonstration down there that I haven't a clue, having a clue. Uh, I had some, I feel like I had something to do with Alex Jones. I'm not sure. Oh, it did. Really? I thought oh. so. Well, he was doing a demonstration today, so I assumed. That. Oh. But it may not be. We get the 9/11. Yeah, we only get those on the 11th. And the fact is what it was. And, and, and oh yeah, they have a national Ron, the Ron Paul circle. I think it's not even Ron Paul. It's the other guy, Baldwin. HR two seven five. Baldwin circle, and, and they and they the they're going to put it on November 22nd. There's a, one of the earlier things I'll be doing is I'll be talking about um, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, um, the pictures of him on the operating table, and I don't own the copyrights on those yet, so I can't allow that to be oh, videotaped. Oh, just tell me when to cut it. Okay, but uh, the other stuff, the really cru crucial stuff, the uh, second headshot, that you can do, okay. because uh, I've already done that, <laughs> and. Uh, we can I've seen the picture of Oswald hmm? talk about it. We can lower the voice. That'd be a very good idea. Why? I'm sorry? I've seen the picture of Oswald that you're talking about. I mean, we were chasing those guys. Yeah, this is something else. something else. Yeah, I'll, I'll, you that click leg. I'll explain it very quickly. Uh, the there were eight rolls of film later. taken of Lee when he was still alive on the operating table at Parkland. We'll have to move it to all. Film that we didn't even know existed. And I acquired all eight rolls last year and took them to Denver, the only place that actually processes that film anymore. So they were not processed? They were not processed after, after 44 years. So what kind of quality of image did you get? Huh? I think the technical term is crappy, okay. but um, <laughs> they were heat damaged, they were, they were uh, water damaged, they were age damaged certainly, and, and uh, they'd been stored in Florida in Florida heat for Lord knows how many years. And uh, when we processed the film, it came out absolute black. You couldn't see a thing. The D-Max was, was horrendous. You couldn't see frame lines or anything. So we very, very sad about it. Uh, I got this idea. There's a, there's a chemical called Farmer's Reducer, which actually clears away some of the D-Max and thins it out a little bit. And uh, so I suggested that we give that a try, and we did. And uh, we just about make out frame lines, and we put it on the computer-controlled printer and ended up with 85 usable pictures. Oh. And I'm using about half of those in the book, okay. the new book. So I have a small handful of them here to show you what, what exists. And uh, it's definitely Lee. There's no question about it. Uh, I took him to Dr. McClelland, who's a friend of mine, and, and he identified almost all the doctors <coughs> in the pictures. Dr. Crenshaw himself and others. And uh, no one's ever seen them. No one even knew they existed. So what, what this will do, this is an entire chapter of, the, of my new book, and it's going to give people a chance to take a step back into history and see something that only a handful of people ever saw and that nobody even knew existed. So why would somebody that first they went to all the trouble to make the photographs, mm -hmm. then they, they put them away without developing them, even though it was so, it was historic, why, what, what was certain? There were several people involved. The, the person who took the pictures didn't have them. They were confiscated from him. And the person who confiscated them is the one who had them. But he had no interest in the case, was afraid of all of this and uh, gave them to somebody else who gave them to me. And I had them developed. What can you learn from the pictures about? Absolutely nothing. It's just a piece of history. No, so what you can learn is, is one thing that's very important. Uh, I have heard several people on the other side say that Lee died on the way to the hospital, that he was, he was still, when he got there, there was no chance. I heard it started night, it was an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah, well, what we've got is we've got two, two of the pictures that actually show the heart monitor, and he had a very strong, stable heartbeat. Well, that's one thing we can learn from it. What's, what's interesting about the pictures is, I mean, they're, 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 they are quite gruesome. I mean, Lee's lying there on the table with his chest cut open, and they pull his heart out, and they're massaging it, and it's 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 amazing piece of history. It's, a, it's one of those things that's like passing an accident. You don't want to look, but you can't help it. You can't look away from it. They're, they're, they're interesting pictures. So since the, the issue that I'm dealing with here that deals specifically with the, um, with the second headshot, the isolation visually of the second headshot, 
it doesn't take long to go through that. I wanted to give a bit more than just that. There's other stuff in the book that I, I don't dare reveal until it's printed because it'll get stolen real, real quickly. So I wanted to, the reason why I wanted to do this up in, um, in Pittsburgh is that Cyril Wecht has been one of the strongest proponents of the second headshot for all these years. And um, I felt that, you know, especially with all the hell that he's gone through in the last couple of years, he deserved some good press, <laughs> some, good, yes. some good feeling, something to verify what, what he said. And um, so I wanted to, to release it at his conference, I, thinking, of course, that the book would be out by then, and it's not. The fellow who was going to finance the printing of the book uh, couldn't afford to do it. There was a problem that came up. What are you going to call your book? It's called JFK Absolute Proof. And um, whereas the killing of a president in the search for Lee Harvey Oswald each had a little more than 600 photographs each, this one has 800. Hey, Steve. How you doing, buddy? And uh, so that's. That brings the total of, of the, the pictures in the three books in the trilogy to 2,000, just a little over 2,000. And this is probably going to be the last book I'm ever going to do. Can't wait to get it. A lot of people have, have waited for it, and you know, I. One of the one of the chapters in the book deals with uh, the president's brain, where it is, and photographs of it. Uh, another one deals with. Uh, Oswald, absolute proof that Oswald worked for the uh, for the Central Intelligence Agency. Right. Well, stuff we've always suspected before, but this is the actual proof. I had someone uh, we know come to me and tell me that Dr. Smith had examined JFK's brain in the National Archives, and it was definitely a shot from the phone. Really? That I didn't know. I heard, I heard that. Issue. Well, it, it, do you believe it? Is it? I don't know you whether to believe that or not, unless I saw some. Photographs along with it or some yeah. evidence. Well, I'm also, there, there's, you guys are probably aware that I found a photograph in the archives, an autopsy photograph that's not in the official, um, uh, arch, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Official uh, mm -hmm. inventory. And it's a black and white photograph on 120 film, and uh, I reproduced that. There's a lot of good stuff in the book. And I'm just aware that Gary Mack's going to attack it the very first day. It's, it's his job. So. Has anyone considered the parallel between Gary Mack and Darth Vader? <laughs> Used to be Anakin Skywalker, not anymore. Uh, Gary, Mack, um, Gary Mack is a fellow who got interested in the Kennedy case when he saw me on Goodnight America. Um, the Geraldo Rivera show. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a very, very outspoken person on our side for a long time until the Sixth Floor Museum offered him $70,000 a year. And then all of a sudden you can't get him to admit that there was a conspiracy. And he's appeared on all of these garbage uh, Discovery Channel shows and uh, now backing the other side. I have no idea how much money he's making now, but it's got to be a lot more than that. I figure that even if he never got a raise in all these years, they paid him well over three quarters of a million dollars to sell out. Yeah. Well, he was the one that came up. You know, he was instrumental on the the badge man and mm -hmm. stuff. So. Now try to get him to admit it. Yeah. Uh, Do you know badge man? Oh, that's the guy. The guy. The guy behind the stockade fence. Right. Him. He seems to. He seems to be. Uh, uh, dressed as a policeman. Well, now the badge man, now the Discovery Channel deal, uh, the story is, you know, here they've taken photographs of a man standing back there with these cameras and you, you just don't see anything like that in the Mormon photograph. Right, because they're faking everything. They're changing the position, the height, and everything else, and the size. They've done that every time. What they've done this time I guess you. I guess you all saw the uh, inside the target car. Mm -hmm. the thing. First of all, the president at the time that he's killed is slightly tilted to the left, but he's facing straight ahead. They've got the head turned this way by about thirty or forty degrees to the left. 
then the, this idiot who fires from the knoll, instead of hitting where the bullet really went in, he shoots up here in the front by the, by the uh, forehead. So naturally, since they've changed the angle and the location of the wound, they have the bullet coming out of the side of the head. They said it would have, we would have had a dead Mrs. Kennedy is the quote. Of course, they forget to tell you that in frame 313, the moment of the headshot, Mrs. Kennedy is sitting about seven to eight inches farther forward of the president and not sitting next to him at all. When they were shooting the scene out in Dealey Plaza, I showed them the actual photographs and showed them they were doing everything exactly wrong. And they said, oh, it's not important. These are not important issues. These are, these are just minor points. It's the whole thing. And Gary Mack is standing there, and all he can say is, you got the X in the wrong spot, Robert. Yeah. Which I don't. But he said I did. That's all he cared about. You know, why they would go to somebody who's done absolutely nothing in the case instead of somebody who really knows it is just beyond me, if they cared at all. Of course they don't. But when you think about, about Gary Mack, what has he done? You know, he's, he's done two things. He carried Mary Farrell's message about the possibility of the sounds being on the acoustics tape to the, to the uh, HSCA. It wasn't even his idea. He just brought it up there for her. And the other thing was the discovery, as you said, of Badge Man. And Badge Man was actually discovered by President Carter's sister, Ruth Stapleton. Excuse me. Hello. Robert? Yeah. It's my birthday. I get getting calls all day long. Happy birthday. Thank you. Just Bobby. Abraham called. Abraham. Yeah. I remember uh, Larry Howard came up with a roll of, what was it, 8 millimeter film. 8 millimeter film. film. Mm -hmm. It was totally black. Yeah. Sent it to you. He showed it. He had it. He was putting it in an envelope. Showed it to me as it went in an envelope. It went to you. Was there anything that you could do further on that? Now, nowadays there just might be, but probably not. The actual story behind that was it was supposed to be, and actually this is very good. We're getting a chance to do something so you guys don't get too bored waiting for everybody else to show up, if they ever show up, if they're going to show up. Um, that was the roll of film that was found in the... Um, uh, possession of, uh, allegedly, of Roscoe White. Yeah. It was supposed to be the, uh, the role of film that he said he got from the, the soldier on the grassy you knoll, which would have been Gordon Arnold. Uh, the thing is that what Gordon said is that he took the film out of the camera there in the plaza, which exposed it to daylight, so there wouldn't be any image left at all. It would have been totally light struck if the story's true, if it's even the same role of film, the, the whole thing, the whole story. Thing is that, that Gordon said that, uh, that he took footage of the, uh, of the uh, motorcade, which means that the, that type of a camera, and this is another thing which goes back to Gary Mack, it's something that was never resolved is the type of film that it was. Was it in a cartridge? Was it a reel-to-reel? -reel? There were a few cameras, not many, very, very rare, but there were some that used regular 8 millimeter cartridges, similar perhaps to Super 8 cartridges, which didn't even exist yet. They were still experimental. So I wanted to ask um, uh, Gordon, you know, what type of film it was. Was it a cartridge that, that he had in the camera, or was it a roll of film? Well, Gary, who knew how to get in touch with him, refused to let me know how. Wouldn't give me the phone number, wouldn't, wouldn't let anybody get to him. He wanted him to be his witness. So Gordon died, and we never found out. It's never been resolved, and now probably never will be, all because of Gary Mack. My recollection was that Gordon uh, did not want his picture taken by anybody over there, and Larry Howard went over there and kind of took some pictures around that, that showed him at an angle or something, and then gave that to me. Ah. Well, I have that somewhere. Well, Gordon, as I recall, did not remember exactly where he was standing. And of course, they were, uh, Nigel Turner was trying to make a specific point about uh, the badge man. He had Gordon stand arbitrarily in one spot and sort of vaguely point over his shoulder toward where the badge man was. I believe that I found Gordon Arnold in, in the plaza in one photograph. He's standing heavily in shadow. I assume that nobody has my book 
hear the, the killing of a president? Not here. Okay. If you've got the if you've got it, check the large picture from um, Jim Towner uh, that shows the grassy knoll. It shows three people on the knoll. One of them walking uh, up the stairs. Well, I think it's Buddy Walters, and then uh, somebody else is halfway there, and then a fellow in a um, work suit, a work outfit, is standing on the little pedestal beside the pergola, and he's looking into the parking lot. If you look just to the left of the tree, the big tree that's there, deeply in shadow, there's a shape there blocking the view through to the, to the parking lot. Steve, you've seen it. You know it is. Yeah. And um, that's where Gordon Arnold actually was, which is much farther to the, uh, to the uh, north than Nigel had him. But he, I think he is there. Uh, we know he's there because cause Senator Yarbrough saw him there. Yeah, and testified to Senator Yarbrough saying that he saw the soldier hit the ground and all that. Right, so we know he was there. And Senator Yarbrough got involved, and that's when I went over to D. Platt, took a picture of Senator Yarbrough talking to Penn Jones, and I put that up on the head of my, my Yahoo group. You're so cool, man. <laughs> you really are. I've been around a while. Yeah. So. It's, uh, you know, I wonder, once uh, W moves here to, to Dallas, I wonder how safe any of us are going to be. Oh. Well, I've, I've argued that the Bush Library would be a terrorist target. Yeah, and, certainly. And when I, when I made that comment before the University Park City Council, the Dallas Morning News is there, took my, had my, ran my picture in color on the, the front page of the local section. <laughs> did not quote a single word from me over in the article. I had somebody, I had a district judge come to me and said, well, I want to read what you said. They didn't quote you. So here's your picture. Welcome to the Dallas Morning News. That's the Dallas Morning uh, Republican uh, conspiracy. <laughs> News speak. Last year you said that they were run, trying to run a petition there in Highland Park uh, to get Bush not to move there. Remember that? Well, there, yeah, there, there have been some. On that. There, <laughs> there have been some um, some efforts. Um, let's see. Well, let's see. I guess maybe that was Beth Blankenship that had a petition like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, there have been all kinds of maneuvers to try to stop Bush yeah. so from having the library there. <laughs> um, Particularly his house. Well, we heard initially that, that he was moving into this new house that was under construction across the street from where Dick Cheney lived when he was chairman of Halliburton. He lived on so the Euclid come back next right. to the Halliburton Park City Hall. Okay, there was a real estate agent that they stranded them got there. The local paper, the they stranded them there. No cliff. Published a little article <laughs> a saying story. Bush had purchased that property, but that was never in the deed records of Dallas County. The deed records show it was purchased by a guy who lived another half half a block away, and it turns out, best we can tell, Bush is not interested in that one. Two two questions. Sure. Did you or Dr. Wett in the 80s, by any chance, uh, try to communicate with the Surgeon General who was C. Edward Coop to see if he'd be, regarding the medical photos, to see maybe if he may be interested I don't, I, in I, I don't know about Cyril. I certainly did not. Okay. okay. I did not. Um, you know, every once in a while someone will come up with a really good idea like that, but uh, it's too late for us to do something about it now, but the problem was that the Kennedy family, through the, uh, the Kennedy's uh, attorney, controlled all access to those pictures. And the way they got suppressed in the first place is the fact that they illegally, the government illegal, illegal, illegally gave those pictures, which didn't belong to anybody, particularly they belonged to all of us because it was Department of the Navy film, they gave them to the Kennedy family who controlled it, controlled them and, and withheld them from public view until the year 2039 or until the death of the last remaining Kennedy child, whichever occurs last. Mm -hmm. So it's a minimum, a minimum of 75 years of illegal suppression. Um, when I got a hold of them, I decided that the public had to see them, that, that the world needed to see them, and I released them. And I was, you know, they tried to prosecute me on it, but uh, uh, the government. For, for doing it, but it was ruled that it was just a journalistic leak, and since they were illegally suppressed in the first place, they didn't want to make a big deal out of it. They didn't want to make a federal case out of it. So who was after you about that? Um, it's not really very clear. Um, I have a feeling that it had something to do with Blakey. 
But was there actually any any legal proceeding against you over that? They never filed legal proceeding because it was ruled it was a journalistic leak. But I have a feeling that they were they were going to try to. I, I testified for five days in front of the uh, uh, assassination. Or, or, I'm sorry, the um, the ARC. Hmm? Yeah, the uh, uh, assassination archive. And like, what am I trying to say? My mind. I'm so tired. Yeah, yeah, the. Um, the review board, yeah. oh. the ARR being, yeah, so that's National Records Review Board. And, um, are you going to be showing stuff right from the start of the talk? No, not, not immediately. Just lower the lights when you let me. Okay. You had some other legal proceedings involving some stuff that was stolen from you, is that, that correct? Yeah, Diane Allen, who used to work for me, stole the entire photographic archive on the case. And uh, she was ordered to give it back by the court. She refused to. They sent her to jail for six months. But she knew the value of it and would rather go to jail for six months than return it. So she never did. Yeah. She still has them. Well, I have a final question. Yeah. yeah. Why? Go get them. <laughs> yeah, I wish we could. Uh, the U.S. Marshals came to her house and searched it. And they did such a terrible job. They were sitting at the top of her stairs, we later found out. And they never picked them up. They never even found out where they were. Yeah, Mr. President, yeah. regarding the Zapruder film versus the Orville Nix film, um, Mike had brought up a point downstairs about, well, Mike, why don't you explain it if you, if you could? <laughs> well, we, 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 we've debated on this back and forth already. But um, no, there's, a, there's a one cl very clear difference between the two, and it has to do with Clint Hill getting onto the back of the car. And I forget which is which, but on one of them, you see, uh, Clint Hill gets on the on the trunk and um, he, he uh, grabs um, Jacqueline Kennedy, who's half on there, and kind of put kind of puts her back in in the seat and then he, you know straddles across. On the other uh, film, uh, he when he gets on the trunk, she already puts herself back in in the seat. Well, the the Zabruta film is the correct uh, rendition of it because of the angle it was shot at. You can see that they never touch. But because uh, Nix was taken from the other side of the street and he was standing closer, uh, 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 Clint Hill was standing closer, the, the angle, uh, how can I try to explain this? Uh, you've, got, you've got Jackie here, you've got Clint here. Now Zapruder is shooting from this side here so you can see that there's clearly no, no contact between them. However, Nix is shooting from this way so He's uh, Nick. Uh, Nick gets uh, Clint Hill uh, obstructing the view to Jackie. He never does touch her. In one of them, you clearly, I looked at this. You can't. You can't look at the, uh, the uh, film going by at regular speed because I've tried to on the Nick. I think it's the Nick's film. It's very difficult to tell. But if you look at the stills, it becomes very clear. <coughs> he, you can see actually. He, he he has her hands on her. And he how dare he? That's the first lady. <laughs> no, he never touches her. He doesn't. He well, appears to, and he was. He would have if she hadn't gone in by well, herself. That's what I see. I'm, uh, I'm well, not the only one. But that's what yeah, uh, well, other people see. In that. I've studied that for, I guess, pretty close to thirty odd years now, and as I can see, they never really touch. As a matter of fact, as long as we're waiting, can we turn that on? We don't have to wait. Bob. Okay. Well, I'm just <laughs> since the point is made now, I just. And since I got it here, may as well, and then I'll get into it because I don't have very, really very much. It's in several books. Uh, that would probably be good. It's a telephone. Everybody had cell phones in '63. We wouldn't be here. That's true. <laughs>
I'm not sure whether the actual frames that we that we want are actually on here, but we don't really need the sound, but it's on. Out of the side here. Sorry about that. Hello? Yeah, Eric? Okay, I'll see you then. You too, thanks. Bye bye. He's just flooding the heck out of me, isn't it? This is just going to fight me every inch of the way. Try it again. Huh? I have to watch that again. Okay. Again, you got to remember that, that Nix is actually behind where the president's car was by a half a block. Mrs. Kennedy, at the time that that happens, is sitting about the middle of the car, and Clint Hill is all the way to the left. He never actually touches it. No. The sound of the gunshots were from the recordings made in Dealey Plaza during the tests for the House Assassinations Committee. The timing goes to the actual tape recording that uh, McLean made, Officer McLean made. We took the actual timing and I superimposed the shots because on the McLean tape, the sound of the motorcycles is just too loud for us to hear the sound. So. Well, I only dealt with the ones that we could see. There's actually five there, but one is 0 0.7 seconds next to the other, so it sounds like one. Well, you're still hearing the end of one, you're still getting a second one, but they're right on top of each other. There actually are five, but we only hear four, which is, I think, what happened in the plaza a lot, too. Oh, that's Officer Baker running into the depository. I'm sorry? Oh, no, no. This is, this is a compilation of probably 25 different films. Yeah, quite a few did. You'll, you'll see that in a minute.
Actually, if that we probably could stand to use the sound. You see? Thank you. There they go. Just from that, that the 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 yeah. I estimate about 400 people ran to the no. Initially, only one person ran to the depository. Anyway, that's that's that. Uh, what's it? Sure. The whole thing. I, I could see it again. All right. Hey. Or at some point, you were doing some work on something. Who's inside the uh, other venues on the sixth floor? Yeah. Where do you stand on that? I, I, I see it there. I see it in both the, uh, the Hughes film and the Bronson film. And the Browns are just beginning to thin out. Is it possible to let us know which, who, who's filming each one is? That Much more. Nix. Towner. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, I think of this for a minute. My mind just went blank. Um, much more again. Hughes. Towner. Oh, it's Dorman. The other one was Dorman. This is... Uh, I'm sorry? No. No, it's just... I couldn't remember the name for a minute. This is Towner. This is... Um, Hughes. Or Bell. This is Bell. Zapruder, of course. Much more. Nix. Ah, but Zapruder, rather. Then Nix. I didn't use Pascal because she doesn't show anything. Yeah, she started filming before. She was filming before and after, but not during. This is uh, um, uh, uh, Daniel, the Daniel film. The audio, the audio is something I created after the fact, because you know, the film silent by itself is just so frustrating. So I, I made the audio. The audio is not from Dilly Plaza. From the radio, from uh, from Dallas radio, from different broadcasts. That's not. It's not Kennedy's foot. You mean the the one on on uh, Stemmons? That's actually Clint Hill's foot. Yeah, lying on the trunk of the car with his foot hanging over the edge. Uh, he was lying in, in Jackie's lap, but his foot never came up in the air. It's not like he just flipped. Um, I have other photographs which I've published in, in my books that show that. As a matter of fact, in the new book, I, I, go, I show several of those pictures where you can take him from slightly above where you can see his whole leg, not just the foot. And you see the... the yeah, spread eagled over the car, uh, the uh, trunk. I'm sorry. No, he never climbed on top of Jackie. He stayed on the trunk the whole way, all the way to the hospital. 
safer though to hang on that way. Like, could we try to get in and pull her off? Yeah, that could be too. Besides, it would be kind of inappropriate to jump on top of the first lady, I guess. Yeah, there were two of them. Just two of them going backwards. Everybody else is going toward the knoll. Are they involved? That little old lady has always made me suspicious. That's CBS footage. That's Bell. The Umbrella Man does appear in some of these, yes. That's that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, as long as we're here, this, uh, who had the flashlight before? Here. Can I borrow that? Thanks. That way we won't have to turn on the light. Oh, never mind. Thank you. That's all right now. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I did. I hope I did. I don't have it. Double check, though. I got it. Great. I'm going to find this right one here. Um, Okay. All right. I don't think do I don't think we need that anymore. I don't think. He wants it on his video. Oh, do you? Okay. Fine. All right. The um, of course the, the time of the assassination. This was taken at the moment uh, just before the fatal headshot. The president and uh, just an opening frame. It's not for anything in particular. Oh. By the way, this is going to be the cover of the new book, Absolute Proof. This is uh, from the uh, Bronson film, and it's taken at the exact moment of the fatal headshot. We see the explosion right here. There's Abraham Zapruder and uh, Marilyn Sitzman, and there's the uh, black dog man. The Black Dog Man is the man who's standing behind the uh, corner of the wall. He's photographed by seven different photographers. Immediately after the assassination, he ran back into the parking lot and he's never been identified. Uh, this is important uh, as, a, as a side point. Somebody mentioned before downstairs about the uh, book Mortal Error, Bonar Menninger and uh, Howard Donahue's book. Well. As you can see here, nobody is standing up with a machine gun <laughs> or any kind of a gun. That was a fantasy. Uh, both, both of them, uh, Bonar Menninger and Howard Donahue, both came to my house before the book was ever published. And I showed them the, the, the whole film of this, frame by frame, showing that it didn't happen. And they knew it didn't happen, but they published the book anyway. Okay, these are the ones that I can't uh, have photographed. Okay. Um, these photographs were taken inside the, um, the operating room at Parkland when Lee Oswald was still alive. Lee's there on the operating table. As you can see, I was able to pull a lot out of this. When you look at the negatives, you can't see any image at all. It's really, truly remarkable. This is the inside of Lee's chest. Here he's, he's cut open, and uh, this, these are his innards. There's his face, so we know it's him. 
This picture was taken right after he died. Uh, they've taken the endotracheal tube out of his mouth at this point. This is the first photograph of him in death. There are several of him in life. Um, the book will have, uh, I've taken the Alkins photographs, the entire set, and I've colorized them. Uh, so they are now, uh, for the first time, available in color. I have the missing frames of the Zapruder film as well. All the ones that were cut out by Life magazine, they'll all be there too. This is frame 210. This is the, the frame that the Warren Commission and FBI stated was the frame where the first shot could have been fired because the live oak tree is blocking the view from the window. Can I turn the camera? Now you can, yes, you can turn it on now. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is frame 210. Now some of these pictures I've released in the magazine that I sell in Dilly Plaza, but they're much smaller there than they'll be in the, in the book. They'll be much larger in the book. Uh, this is the, another one. This is actually uh, the uh, frame that corresponds to a jiggle analysis that, uh, for a shot that occurred before this point. Now, I was talking to one of the Dilly Plaza witnesses about four years ago. Her name is Jean Newman. Uh, Steve, I think you were there when we were talking, you were there when we were talking to her. And she told me that she saw a bullet hit the street and told me where she saw it hit. So I went back to the Zapruder film and I actually studied it through a microscope, frame by frame. This is Phil Willis and directly in front of him we see the street and there's absolutely no problem there. Nothing's happened. One eighteenth of a second later, at frame 143, the bullet strikes the street right in front of him. Right there. Exactly where Jean Newman told me that the shot would be, where she saw it hit. And she saw the uh, spatter go toward the rear. She said the shot definitely came from the front. Here, in the next frame, 144, the stuff has started to settle, but you can still see the result of the shot. This is something that has always uh, eluded us. We've never seen this before. This is br a brand new discovery. There, there it is, right there. That's where the bullet actually struck. There was a shot, the one that President Kennedy responded to, and he responded to this shot way back in the 150s. Now this is the proof of the second headshot. This is perhaps the most important of the new discoveries in the case. And this is what I've come to offer you guys who were great enough to show up here and, and come to this conference. You're familiar with the uh, acoustics evidence, uh, Officer McLean. Um, a fraction of a second after this frame of the film was taken, turns around, looks over his shoulder at us, and then reaches down with his left hand and he keys the microphone of, the, uh, of his car, of his uh, motorcycle rather and starts to record the sounds of the shots onto this dicta belt. That's the actual dicta belt itself. The House Assassinations Committee did acoustics testing right over there in Dealey Plaza. And when I found out they were going to do this, I wrote them a memo, which they did publish. The memo is in actually, actually in the, uh, the volumes published by the House Committee, where I suggested that they fire from every suspected firing point. Professor Blakey, of course, ignored what I had to say. They fired from only two positions. They fired from the sixth floor window, which we see here, and they fired from the grassy knoll. There's the grassy knoll, and the test shot fired from there. Mm -hmm. Hi. <laughs> you fell asleep. <laughs> 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 so I just don't want him to miss it is all. Okay. I might want to take away his, he's a tired guy. He works more than any of us. You don't have to buy the DVD anymore. So. There you go. Okay. <laughs> when we worked on the, uh, everyone's familiar with, with um, the scientists that worked on the uh, acoustics evidence. Jim Barger, Mark Weiss, Ernest Ashkenazi. Well, I was the fourth. But I didn't work with, with that part of it. I dealt with the visual part of it. We synchronized the Zapruder film to the acoustics tape. They had originally 15 shot impulses with three potential shots from the grassy knoll. Through filtration and, and elimination of, of, uh, of the evidence, they actually got rid of uh, many and many of the shots. And when they were finished, they were left with five, five shots together. 
Now, there's Mark Weiss and Ernest Ashkenazi. They were testifying before the House Committee. And they were, these are the best guys in the world on acoustics evidence. There's no question about it, along with Jim Barger. And uh, here we see some of the, uh, the waveform showing the results of the shots and the echo patterns. What they were left with, now of course you guys are all familiar with the case, you know that the government now said uh, through the House Committee that there were four shots. We had five. This one, which has a greater degree of probability based on the echo patterns and the acoustic fingerprint, had a greater probability than this one, but because it was so close to this one, they arbitrarily removed it. It was there though. Lakey didn't want that many shots, he just wanted four. This is the fatal headshot right here, the one that came from the grassy knoll. And this is a recreation from, uh, from JFK. I shot this shot when we were doing the, uh, the movie. Uh, this is supposed to be Gordon Arnold, but he's in way the wrong spot. Gordon was actually around over here. This is the waveform for the fatal shot, the one from the grassy knoll. The actual shot itself is here. This is the muzzle blast at this point here. Uh, the actual ultrasonic uh, sound wave is this one, the real big one. That's before the actual sound hit the microphone, the sound of the uh, explosion. Boo, hiss. Anyway, this is Professor Blakey, of course, who didn't want there to be too many shots. This is Dr. Donald Thomas. Dr. Thomas is the only person to ever do a peer review of the actual uh, acoustics evidence. And he increased the probability from 95% or greater to 98% or greater. And he was absolutely right. And this is what he, this is what he had. This is the, the timing of the shots. Between the first two shots is 1.7 seconds. Of course, it takes 2.3 seconds to fire the rifle twice. Uh, between 1.1 1. 1. 1 seconds, or let's face it, one second apart, you've got two more shots. Then you've got a gap of 4.8 seconds uh, between the first volley of shots and the second. This is the shot that killed the president from the grassy knoll, and this is one that followed 0 0.7 seconds later, less than three quarters of a second later. These are closer than any of these. This is frame 312 of the Zapruder film, the last frame before the fatal shot. We're all familiar with this, but we'll go through it anyway. This is 313, and of course, everybody is familiar with the argument, well, the explosion's in front of the head. No, it's not. This is the front of the explosion, that's the point of entry, and there's the rear of the explosion there. You see how much lighter it is? It went to the rear as well, but because the sun is coming from the right side, as we view it here, the, uh, uh, the president's head is casting a shadow against that part of the rear of the explosion, so a lot of it is obliterated visually. We can't see it. Notice here that there's still a piece of brain in the air at this point. Now at frame 318, five frames after the headshot, Zapruder hears it. The bullet travels faster than the speed of sound. Zapruder didn't hear it. He saw it, but he didn't hear it until now. And when he hears it, he jumps. This is part of the jiggle analysis that Louis Alvarez did back in 1964. And it works. But the reason why he didn't have enough of these, we didn't know it at the time. He was not working from the real film. When you think about it, that's pretty obvious. He was working from the frames that appear in volume 18 of the Warren Commission report and volumes. At 318, we see this terrible jiggle happen because the pruder hears the sound and it startles him. And the president at frame 321 has now hit the rear as far back as he's gonna go and then he bounces off the seat and starts to go forward. And he stays forward until this point. Now notice, please, this is the front of the president's head wound right here. Notice how flat it is? One eighteenth of a second later, at 327, there is a second headshot, which occurs right there. And the wound starts to go forward. It, it grows. Between that frame and this frame, it grows forward. And in the frames, two or three frames that follow, the immediate frame that follows that explosion, you see the brain coming out here? 
We have been looking for all these years for an explosion similar to the 313 explosion. The problem is, by the time this happened, all that mass was gone. There's much less brain left. And as, the, as this happens, as the bullet strikes the president's head, it forces the brain matter forward and downward and into Mrs. Kennedy's lap. And here, between 327 and 331 and 332, we have an identical jiggle. Zapruder hears this shot, and he starts to go, whoa, bingo. We have it again. We have exactly the same thing that we would see. Now, if you'd like to see it in motion, here it is. By the way, this is 335, the first really clear frame, where we see the skull flap downward and opened from the top of the head up here. And we see how the top has been sheared off completely. And the exit wound, that uh, volcano shape in the back of the president's head. Now here it is in motion. Notice from the, the, from the first one where it's totally flat, immediately thereafter it grows and then the brain starts flying out. This is the second headshot. Cyril Wecht was right, several of us were right for all these years. There actually is a second headshot. And I'm sorry? Or more than Noel. The Noel was the first of the two headshots. The second one came from behind. Now, there is a point to consider here that is a possibility. Uh, as you probably all know, Governor Connolly was aware of being hit in the back immediately. But he was not aware until he woke up in the hospital that he'd been hit in the wrist and the thigh. There is a possibility, although not a probability, but a strong possibility, that at this point, as the bullet goes through the president's head, it enters the back of his head here just above the hairline, exits from that point in the front of the, the wound and the side of his head. I think that bullet went on and hit Governor Connolly in the right wrist, and that's when he begins to drop the hat from his hand. If there was a magic bullet, a bullet that went through both men, this would, would have been it in my, in my, yes sir. Where was the exit on uh, Kennedy? It, that right there. The, the exit is right here. Let me, let, me, let me back it up. On your face, where would it be? Right here. With the front of that massive Same fault. Where the, where the front shot is. Pretty much. Pretty close to where the front, the front shot went in. Okay, here at, at 327. 326, again, it's flat. Totally flat. But at 327, we have this bright spot right there, which I think is related to this shot. And at that point, that exact point, that's where the, the wound expands. But it's instantaneous. It happens in an eighteenth of a second. It would happen probably a lot faster, except the film is shot at, at 18 frames per second. So we have that happen there. The bullet then, I think, exits through. If we had a pointer, you could see that there is a direct line to Governor Connolly's hands. Now, at this point, Connolly is still holding that Stetson hat in his hand. At this point, it becomes obscured by the, by the rest of his arm and his